Hello, hello. Ah, hola, como estas? Me llamo Jesse. And that's about four years of high school Spanish, so <laughs> I tried. Uh, thanks for, uh, for sticking around. I know I'm the only thing that's keeping you guys from lunch. So I'm going to make this really quick, but there's a lot of good stuff that you know, I've learned over the past year from building all these games that I wanted to share them with you. So I kind of summed this talk up in this idea of the five keys to success when building HTML5 games. There's kind of like a little play on that HTML5 and 5 thing. So <clears throat> my background, um, I had an introduction. I'm not going to go a little too deep into it, but uh, I put up my information up here, especially my email, because my job at Amazon is to help developers be successful. So that's from either writing blog posts, doing talks like this, or just talking to you individually. So you know, if you guys are building anything cool, um, if it's in the HTML5 space, if it's in the native space, please feel free to email me directly. I always like to see what people are doing. And I'm always quick to try to you know, offer feedback and help. I mean, I spend a lot of time working with developers, and I've seen a lot of stuff being built. So there's a lot of advice that I can help offer you guys. And you know, being an evangelist means that I wind up going to a lot of these conferences and you know, I, I get to see where technology is going. And, you know, a, a while ago, I want to say if about four years ago is when we started seeing kind of like the death spiral of Flash. And I started trying to move away from that and figuring out where I was going. And on the way to HTML5, you know, it, it wasn't until Canvas really became a little bit more stable and working across different platforms that I started falling in love with it and going back to my roots of just doing regular JavaScript and HTML. And one of the things that actually is great now about building games in HTML5 is the fact that there's a huge community that has all kinds of frameworks, and these frameworks are getting more and more powerful. I think the joke goes something like, there are more HTML5 game frameworks than there are HTML5 game developers. So it's really hard to kind of figure out which one to use. So I started out using Impact.js, and I think this round in Flash, I built so many game engines, and I've built game engines in, in native languages too, and I didn't want to go back and do that again, so I decided to pick some of the best frameworks because I wanted to focus on making games. And I think if there's anything you can learn from this talk, it's the idea that don't reinvent the wheel, don't go out and build a framework, go find the framework that works and make a game. Focus on making a game because that's the hardest part. As developers, we like to you know, reinvent the wheel all the time. So go pick something else. So Impact is a really good one. A new one that's coming up, and one I did a workshop on yesterday, is, is Phaser. And Phaser is uh, written by Richard Davey, who was a very well-known Flash developer. And this one's a really awesome framework, and it's open source. And then there's a bunch of other interesting ones. EaselJS is a popular one that mirrors some of the Flash APIs. And then Game Maker, which is interesting because it's a standalone IDE that will publish to native, and it will also export to HTML5. And then there's Construct for people who don't like to code and just want to do more drag and drop. So there's a whole bunch of options out there. Ooh. So, and, and really, you know, the, the reason why I build a lot of my games in HTML5 is because I can actually play them on desktop browsers and on mobile browsers. And to really kind of put this point at home, um, I guess I'll, 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 I'll put these stats out. The, the, so at Microsoft, one of the fun things was that I'm, I was rated on my, uh, on my stats from my blog. And one of the things I did was I had a lot of my games on my blog. So my blog stats went up really quick. But a really strange thing is as I was going through the stats and noticing, most of the people who were coming to play my games were actually coming from iPads. And I was seeing like 90% of the people playing my games were on mobile devices. And I think that really speaks to the power of why you would choose HTML5 to build games. If you're looking to target mobile browsers, which is a very big market, you're going to get a, you know, it's the only game in town, really. There's nothing else that'll let you play games in the browser. So, and then all my games, I have the URL up there. Uh, this is a new staging ground I'm putting for all my games as I clean them up. But if you just go to games.jessefreeman.com, you can play most of my games. And a lot of this started last year at this game jam called One Game a Month. So I came in at third place, which is pretty hard to do, uh, one, to build 12 games in a year, and then also to come in third place out of hundreds of other developers. And there's a lot of things that I learned from this process. Uh, one is how to quickly explore and prototype out ideas. Like, you know, how many people build games now? Anyone? Oh, come on. You guys should build more games. There are a lot of fun. I did enterprise development for years. It was the most boring, soul-sucking thing ever. 
And I always made games at night to like, so I wouldn't go and like postal on people. So, okay, well, hopefully I can change you guys into making a few more games. So, the idea of it is that, you know, a lot of us do have ideas. And this even, you know, transpires outside of games is that, you know, you have ideas, but how do you build them quickly? How do you prototype them? And how do you move on to actually building it? Also, it helps teach you how to focus on the core mechanics. So a lot of the times when we're building something, we keep adding on and piling on features and features and scope creep and all that stuff. But in the essence, if you're going to make a game in a month, which really means if you work at a full-time job that you have about a week, that you want to have just the core concept of that game up and running quickly. Also, how to work under pressure. So before I got into evangelism, I did consulting, and I worked on some very large websites under some really awful timelines. So I was always very good at working under pressure, but building a game is very tough because you're building it for yourself. It's a labor of love, and you're your own worst critic. So you have to learn how to speed up that development process and get going. Also, finding the motivation to complete a game. I mean, just making a game is easy. A lot of people start them, but not many people actually finish them. And then finally, you know, every time you publish a game or release something for other people to use, you get an incredible amount of experience by just completing a task. So the worst thing you can do is start something and abandon it and move on. So forcing yourself every month to actually release that game in whatever state it is, and there are some games that I just released like, eh, it sort of works. It's important because it's enough of an idea out there to say, you know what, well, I did it, and now I can take that and go back and fix it later. So a lot of this comes down to the idea, and I love this quote by Stephen King, where it's that talent is cheaper than table salt, and that what separates talented individuals from successful ones is a lot of hard work. And that really is what it is. At the end of the day, I don't even think my games are that great. Um, over the years, uh, or over the year, they've gotten a lot better. But it's really because I put in a huge amount of work to making each one better and better and learning from what, I, uh, what my mistakes were to improve. So the first lesson is the idea of create, refine, and iterate. And what that means is that there's no way that you can build 12 games, 12 unique games in a year and actually you know, finish it. So the idea is that I'll build a game, and then I'll take that game and I'll refine it, I'll tweak it, and then the next game is sort of based either using the same code base or I go back and I will take the same idea, but I'll just remix it and do something different with it. Uh, and then I keep iterating, and I keep going, building this foundation of from good code for one game, moving on to another, to a lot of concepts. So you'll see a lot of my games, they have the same start screens. They have the same credit screens. All the stuff that I try to reuse from one game to the next. And making a game is a never-ending process. So I'm very big on using these like um, to-do lists. I have tons and tons of to-do lists of all my bugs or features I want to add, and some I'll break out into like the next version. So you wind up in these places where it never really has to end. So part of the one game a month made me say, oh, wait, well, this is the feature set I need for this game. And if I like the game a lot or I see that there's a good interest, I'll move on and I'll try it again. Or I'll go back and I'll revisit that game at another time. So a good idea, a good example of this is, this is a game, um, God, I, I, I've been trying to build this game for like 10 years. So I finally built it about four years ago or three years ago when I did my book on Impact.js. And it's really basic. It's, it's modeled after this game called Super Crate Box. And it's a mix between that game, which was a spin-off of Mario, uh, the original Mario Brothers arcade game, and Elevator Action. And it was OK. And I wrote it really quick. And I used it as, as the example in my book. But then over the year, I made two new versions of it for one game a month. And I refined it a lot because I learned that it just wasn't fun to play. And that's a very hard thing for you to accept because games are like art. And my background's in art. I'm a self-taught programmer. And you know, I really equate making games. And even indie game developers are now like the new struggling artist. Like everyone's trying to make this thing that they love so much. So I went through and I cut everything out. And I just refined the game to something that was its core essence and wound up being a really good game and a very popular game that people like to play. So you shouldn't really be afraid to experiment. And that's a really big thing in any, anything you do in life, right? You shouldn't be afraid to just put an idea out there, tweak it, refine it, and keep messing with it until it works. So, and the other big thing about, especially when it comes to game development, is the idea that you should never give up. I mean, I, I guess this guy's like, you know, sweeping this parking lot in forever. But the idea is that, you know, you can't build one game 
and then imagine you're going to be successful. It just, it just doesn't happen. Like no, even you know, Angry Birds was like their 15th game, right? Um, you know, Flappy Birds, he was building HTML5 games. He had like six or seven HTML5 games before Flappy Birds became popular, right? So the idea is that you have to keep building games and keep trying new ideas because one day you'll hit the lottery and someone will like it and then it blows up and everything is good and you're making a lot of money and then you get to retire from whatever it is you do and make games all day long. At least that's what I keep telling myself, right? <laughs> so the second lesson I learned was to design for mobile first. I mean, you know, there's, there's a huge debate on whether you're using web or you're going to go to native or, or whatever it is. And for me, it was always I wanted my games to be playable on the web browser. So I had to think mobile first. And when you think about mobile first, you, especially in gaming, you want to do mobile resolutions. And as we talk about resolution, you know, people kind of get hung up on this idea of like, oh, well, I need this to be this exact resolution or I need to support whatever, like the billions of resolutions that Android devices have these days. But it really comes down to the notion of aspect ratio. So you can solve the equation really easily in gaming if you just think, well, my game supports 16 by 9 and 4 by 3. And in any other situation, I'm going to get black bars, but I can minimize the amount of black bars I get. And, you know, especially when you're building one game a month, you don't really ha care about how perfect it looks on every screen, but you want to get it as close as possible. And also, you want to simplify the UI. So one thing that mobile games have taught us is that you can build very, very basic UIs and have them scale very well to the different aspect ratios. So this is an example of a template I put together when I was working uh, at Microsoft building sort of Windows 8 games. And it still applies to kind of everything I do today. And it's the idea that the middle square represents an 800 by 480 resolution. And that's my web resolution. And from there, I basically scale it up. So that's a 4 by 3 aspect ratio. I can go to 800 by 600. And here's the trick. So in 800 by 600, I actually wind up scaling the canvas up from that size to 1024 by 768. And the reasoning behind it is that you can't always run Canvas at the full resolution of a device. If you try to, it'll completely die. You know, the best example is the highest resolution my game will go natively is up to 1076 by 600, which winds up being kind of like the native resolution of a widescreen laptop. But when I was running this on a 27-inch monitor, if I ran at a full resolution, it would be completely, it would be like three frames a second. So I go to a, a certain resolution that I feel comfortable at that aspect ratio, and then I scale the canvas up from there. And browsers are very difficult because somebody can open a browser that looks like this, like this little weird rectangle, and you have no idea what to do with it. When you start moving towards mobile, you're like, well, I know that there's going to be set aspect ratios and the game isn't going to be resized weird. So that's the kind of thing you do. And so when I resize, I always constrain to these aspect ratios. The other thing that's important is to optimize and compress all your images, your scripts, and your CSS. I can't stress this enough. I mean, if you're building for mobile, you want this to be the lightest, smallest game possible. And a good way to actually optimize your artwork is by creating what we call texture atlases. So a texture atlas is very similar to a sprite sheet, where you take a bunch of images that are in a grid. But what's great about texture atlases is that the artwork doesn't have to be in a grid. It doesn't have to be uniform. It could just be any sizes. And we generate this one gigantic image. And from there, it outputs an atlas. And the atlas represents coordinates on how to actually cut out each of the images in your game. What's great about this is that, one, we can keep textures and memory correct. So for WebGL, we want to use power of two for when we're dealing with textures, so we optimize for the GPU. Also, because we generate out a JSON file, I can actually inject that JSON file into my code. So I cut down on an additional load, and I can minimize the JSON file so that the game is a little bit more optimized. Uh, and I, I wrote an article about this. I mean, I took a game that was having about 200 loads and got it down to 176 loads, which doesn't sound all that impressive, but I actually shaved off about two or three megs off the game. So once you have this PNG, you can actually go through and compress it. Use like a PNG, uh, an 8-bit PNG, or you can take a 24-bit PNG, convert it to an 8-bit PNG, and still retain the alpha um, by using some certain tools. The other thing is automate everything. So because I come from enterprise and agency background, I've taken everything I've learned from enterprise development and I apply it to my games. And that means automation. So when I did Java, I was using um, Ant and whatever other build tools you have out there. So 
and I, I use this quote every time I talk about automation, if you're not automating, you're kind of insane. And the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Now, as humans, we kind of suck at, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. We don't produce that. That's why we have computers. Computers can do the same thing over and over again for you. So make the computer work for you. And the best thing that we can do with this automation is that we can optimize and package up our game. We can also deploy it to multiple platforms. So while I use the same code base for every one of my uh, distributions, I still have to package it up differently. So if I'm doing it to web, it's one way. If I'm doing it to my blog, I might have to change uh, relative to absolute paths. If I'm publishing it to the Chrome store, I need to zip it up and put a manifest file in. I don't want to do all that by hand. I let my code do it for me. And then I can reproduce this. So every game that I do, I don't have to worry about how I'm going to publish it. I just simply worry about making the game. So I rely a lot on Node.js. It's really great as a back-end you know, server-ish thing if you, you know, are comfortable with having you know, lots of JavaScript running on a server. I don't know, I come from more of the, the Java side of the world, so it's, I'm still like, you know, on the fence about it. But for, as a local tool and on the command line, it's really awesome. And there's a lot of great stuff you can do when you pair it up with something like Grunt. So with Grunt, I'm able to reproduce everything I did with Ant, and I have complete automation. And what's even better about this is because all my automation now is in JavaScript. I'm using the same language to write my games as I am my automation tools. So I don't actually have to, you know, oh God, I don't know if everyone's ever used Ant before, but doing that XML structuring is like, like some people are laughing, it's like awful. It makes no sense. Trying to do a conditional inside of Ant was like the worst thing ever. So I have some simple rules around what my grunt file needs to do. And a lot of these aren't very complicated. Uh, the first thing is that I always take a copy of the source code I'm working with. So don't, don't ever, ever manipulate a build script on the code that you're writing. If you want to lose that code, that's a good way to do it. So I take all the code and I copy it to like a temporary directory. And then from there, I take all the JavaScript files, I turn them into one JavaScript file, and I can minimize it. And then if I have JSON files or additional calls, I'll take those JSON files and inject it into there and minify those as well. So this way I get the smallest, most compact JavaScript file I can possibly get. Uh, then I uglify it or I do some sort of obscuring, you know, especially if we're in games. I mean, it's impossible to keep people from hacking games, but I try to make it a little bit difficult to get all the source code out. And then I perform each of my builds. So I'll have a deploy folder that has my web build, my blog build, my app store build, my native whatever wrapper build, and it does everything for me. So the other thing is, Analyze your game. So how many people use analytics in their own apps for their games? Well, there's not a lot of game people, but how many use analytics, right? Yeah, another enterprise thing that I learned. I put tracking in everything. Sorry, if you're playing my games, I track everything you do. Because why wouldn't I? Like, I, don't, I can't sit with every single person who plays my games and see how they play it. And since we're using web, the best part about building HTML5 games is that you can use web, any web library to help you build your game, so why not add analytics to it? And the idea is that you should always know what's going on in your game. You should know every aspect of how many people are playing it, when do they stop, where are they going, even down to like in the stores, what are people buying and when are they buying it? So I can tell what levels that people are buying certain guns and I can see if there's balancing issues. So the most basic thing that I always uh, take analytics on are gonna be the game screens. So I can go through and see at each part of the game who starts the game, who gets to the end of the game. And you know, from one month of data, what I was able to learn on just one of my games was that 19,000 or so unique people played it. Now, to give you perspective, this is one month of a game that I don't really promote that just sits on my website. To get 19,000 downloads in a native store is very difficult without any promotion. Right? So this is, is 19,000 unique, so it's not even how many people are really playing the game. But I'm only seeing 7.5 thousand are actually finishing the game. And strange enough, because I do design it for mobile, so I have a quit button, even in the browser, people are still hitting the quit button instead of closing the tab. So I'm getting 634 people hitting the quit button. But it's telling me that only 38% of the people are actually completing the game. So I'm getting a huge drop off. And because of that, I'm able to actually go back and say, all right, well, what's really going on in my game? Uh, yeah. Okay, there we go. So a lot of this is about finding balancing issues.
everyone take a deep breath. There we go. Okay, so trying to find balancing issues. So I can see from level to level where people are leaving the game or if a level is too hard early on, we're getting a huge drop off in that actual game. So we can go through even deeper and see where the real drop offs are and also inside you know, the lower stuff is the categories of what people are buying in the store and I can see how that relates to what level they're on and whether people are actually making enough money early on in the game to buy the weapons they need to get to the next level or if that's the disconnect. The other thing that's incredibly interesting is that I can find bugs in my game based on the analytic data. So whenever I see really weird analytic data like this, um, something wrong. Every fourth level there's supposed to be a bad guy and only 11 people out of a couple of thousand who make it to level four are seeing the bad guy, and then they don't ever see the bad guy at any other level after that. So right away I'm able to say, oh, I found the bug. And when you're building one game a month, they are riddled with bugs. <laughs> They're just absolutely riddled with bugs. But because I have such a good system in place to find where these bugs are due to the analytics, and I can deploy it very quickly with the automation stuff, I can go and fix these problems whenever I get a chance. So then the last thing is most important is the idea of release early and release often, right? You don't want to hold on to a game. You don't want to hold on to anything for so long because the more you look at it, you know, the more you're going to hate it or the more you're going to think you need to refine it or improve it or whatever and come up with a million different excuses before you actually launch it or publish it. So I just believe in, you know, just do it live. Get it out there and let's just see what happens. And you learn a lot by that because you'll learn immediately people's gut reactions because people will play really crappy games if they get hooked. They don't care if the graphics are perfect or if the story is there. They just want to see that the game is fun and it kills a little bit of time for them. So just keep publishing these games as fast as you can. Because the more games you make, the better you get at it. And this applies to anything, especially if you're going into like an app store. The idea is you won't be found unless you have lots and lots of games. The best thing you can do inside of like a native app store is that related area where it says, also made by this publisher, and you have all the other things that you've made. And you get so much experience by just making each new game. So just keep making new ones and putting them out there. Uh, you know, and the other thing is that we, we want to talk a lot about the idea of how do you keep people playing your game, and we call this the long tail. And there's, you know, a really long, boring-ish definition, but, you know, the, the idea behind the long tail is that every time you release something, there's a huge amount of interest, and then it drops off. And you don't want the drop off to be immediate, you want the drop off to happen over time. And there's a lot of things we can do as game developers to increase that tail and make it go on for, you know, ever, theoretically. So this is just kind of one example. Every time you update a game, people come back and play it. So this is just one cycle from me pushing out other updates, and I keep that long tail going, and getting spikes and getting interest. So in my games, I build in mechanics to let me actually update or add levels or add new players or modify the games quickly. So I'm always thinking whenever I start a game, great, I have my idea, but how do I maintain this idea over time? How do I keep people coming back for more? So this is, I guess, the, the part where you're like, yes, I want to make an H15 game. How do I get it out there? And the real answer is that it's still a little tough to publish H15 games. So naturally, they work really well on the web, right? That's their native home. And like I said, mobile gaming is growing a lot, especially in other countries. In the US, we're not so big on mobile gaming. But in, in Europe and in Asia, there's a lot of mobile game portals. Um, so that's a really great place to put your game, obviously, right out the gate. But then when it, you talk about like putting them into, into native stores, it gets a little tricky. So Cocoon.js is a really interesting uh, piece of technology where what it does is it, it, it literally renders all of your, um, it renders all your graphics into an uh, OpenGL layer inside of a native wrapper, and then it just interprets the JavaScript. So your game actually runs like a native game inside of this wrapper. But it's still kind of finicky. Um, and once you get it to run, it's amazing. And even on Android, it's, I mean, it's blazing fast. PhoneGap is also a nice solution, but the problem with PhoneGap is since audio support, which we just sort of talked about, is so kind of erratic in mobile devices that it's one thing for you, you know, if someone plays your game in the browser, they're like, okay, well, it doesn't play audio, I'm just here to play a free game. But if they're playing in a native 
wrapper or they're playing it in a store, they're going to expect it to be just like every other game. And if you're relying on the web view of that device and it doesn't support audio very well, your game's going to appear broken. And I've seen this time and time again for people who publish games with very bad audio support in native store. People comment, like, game's broken, game's unfinished, doesn't have sound, what is this, blah, 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 lots of F words and all that stuff. So the last option um, is something that we've been working on at Amazon, which is being able to publish in a web app that's live on a website into our store natively. And this is actually kind of interesting, and one of the reasons why I joined up with Amazon. And I love this quote uh, by Tim Tay from Kano Apps, and I, I did a talk with him at GDC about building HTML5 games, and the, the idea, you know, I called him up and I'm like, hey, I really love your guys' games. I want to get them on our device, what can we do? And he says, he went out, he bought a Kindle, he turned it on, loaded up the game, and immediately it worked. And that's like the kind of stories I like to hear. I don't want to hear from emails that, I tried this and had to rewrite all my code, and your platform sucks, and I don't know what to do, and blah. Like, so the way that we've designed this really is that we want you to keep you know, your game where it is, which is online. Like I want to put all my games online, leave them online, because the best way to update and publish web games is to keep them online. You don't have to go back through a submission process, especially if you're moving as agile as I am, where I'm just trying to publish games and do updates as fast as possible. So when you get, we have this uh, app called the Web App Tester, and you download it on a Kindle Fire, um, and the idea is that you simply just put in your URL, and then you test it out. And we show you what it looks like optimized in the Amazon Web View, and what it'll look like when it just is running in the native Android browser, which is kind of like, uh, and then it loads up your game. It's lo loading live from the website. Here you can see I have my touch controls because I'm detecting that it's a mobile game. So I show touch controls where I need them and I hide them when I don't. And then once you're happy with it, all you do is fill out everything you would on a normal app store. So you put in your pictures, your description, but instead of uploading an APK, you just put in a URL and hit submit and you're done. So, and we've done a lot to really optimize this process. So the biggest thing is that we have a custom version of Chromium uh, called Amazon WebView that's built into our devices and our OS. And it even supports WebGL. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing to accelerate it so it feels faster than anything you've seen on Android. Um, also, you know, you can actually charge for your games. So you can sell them in the store. And this works for web apps too. I mean, we support HTML, JavaScript. Everything you'd have is just a web browser. It's just been optimized for our device. And you can also use our in-app purchase API. So we give a JavaScript bridge to allow you to do in-app purchases in everything you do like a native app store. Uh, and then you can also qualify for a lot of the features that we do where we try to promote developers. I mean, we're really big on trying to promote developers in our store. So and as I wrap up, I'll just leave you guys with this quote. And you know, this really sums up kind of any project that you build. And it's that perfection is achieved you know, not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. And I spend an incredible amount of time going through my games and really thinking, do I need this? Is this gonna make it a better experience or is this gonna add two more months of me coding and no one's gonna like it? And Richard Davey, who, um, who wrote Phaser, really drilled this into me early on when I was getting back into making games and he's like, nah, that's stupid, just drop it. Build the simplest game possible, move on. Build it, move on. And a lot of the games I built, I've actually some of the best games I've built, I've, I've done in game jams in six hours or 10 hours. And I just built this core little concept that was really neat and tight, and then I released it. And now I get to spend the rest of this year going back through all the games I built last year and finding the ones that I like, the ones that are popular, and cleaning them up and making them even better. So thanks for listening to me talk. I know everyone's probably starving by now. Um, the big thing is that you know, we have a lot of content about just how to publish to our platform that you can get from our developer uh, portal. And I'm sort of prolific with writing outside of like the books I've done. I also write a lot of blog posts. So you can see my blog post there. And please, um, I'll hang out outside for a little bit if anyone wants to ask me any questions or talk. But I always like to see whatever anyone's working on. Even if it's not for our platform, you just want to share. Because this is a, a very... Um, it's a, it should be a collaborative environment. One of the things that I like about the web community and what I always loved about the Flash community is that everyone shared and the notion that we open source a lot of what we do. Most of my games are open sourced. Um, we all collaborate and the only way that we can learn is by learning from each other. 
So feel free to reach out to me. And you know, there's a bunch of people I've been starting to follow, seeing who's tweeting here that I want to follow and see what you guys are doing. So thanks for having me.